Well, thank you very much. I guess I'll get the ball rolling. So if you wanna, all right. So after that introduction, thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Jordan Stoner. I am an agile, scaled agile and agile trainer at Lockheed Martin Space. And Anthony, if you'd like to. Yeah, I'm I'm Anthony L. I'm also a scaled agile trainer, agile coach at Lockheed Martin Space. We do wear a lot of hats though in, in the efforts we make to uh, help our teams, help the teams we work with across the country. Absolutely. So Anthony and I, just to jump right in, we both speak English. I am from the United States. I'm from the United Kingdom. And I've lived in New Zealand. Uh, all of those countries speak English. But for instance, if I wanted a, um, a shopping cart in the United States, Anthony, what would I want in England? You'd want the shopping trolley. And if I like to go to watch soccer, what would I do in England? You go to a football game. So there might be a few differences in language as we discuss. How about a, uh, what about uh, some, uh, I'd like a pack of chips. You mean crisps? Speak English, Joe, so, speak English to me. Yeah, see, exactly. So as, as we discuss this, it's kind of some of the problems we're saying is, you know, we're, we're struggling with language. We're speaking English, thank you. Like we, we Agile implementations, as we talk, we're, we're, we're speaking this different language. Uh, so problems that we face when we're at Lockheed Martin, we are, we're teaching, we're learning space terminology at Lockheed, at Lockheed Martin, and then they're learning Agile terminology. So there's the understanding of breaking that down, moving back and forth. We're, we're trying to understand that. We're also trying to understand in terms of, you know, we're delivering things at the speed of relevance. We're really trying to like, a non-traditional environments, obviously, that you're trying to do updates to. That's another challenge we work with. Um, and then, you know, kind of understanding the lingua franca of, you know, of space and understanding that and then teaching that to us. So we're trying to do cost-effective solutions. We're trying to have high quality, obviously, uh, delivery at the speed of relevance, and then practical support and maintenance in, obviously, unique environments. So. So as we talk about this a little more, I just want to talk a little bit. We did this presentation at, the, at uh, your conference and then at the Scaled Agile Summit in 2022. And Scaled Agile helped us get these graphics. Uh, they kind of allow us to tell the story because we weren't allowed to use images of the show for legal reasons. So we really have to use you know, these and they help us tell the story. So if it, those of you who don't know, Ted Lasso, he's a, uh, a, the story kind of of the show. He's a quasi successful American football coach. Uh, who gets recruited by Rebecca, the character, the third one over, to coach soccer in England because of that success. Rebecca initially wants him to fail uh, because she's mad at her husband. She and her into the club. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the, the beginning of the story. And then as we kind of go on, the, um, the show kind of goes from there. Ted's kind of this folksy Midwestern guy, uh, you know, kind of smarter than he lets on, but really kind of uh, you know, wants to, you know, nice guy, wants to help the team win. And obviously uh, Coach Beard is kind of his tactical genius, you know, running the plays, understanding the technical aspects of things. Uh, Rebecca is the aforementioned team owner. She's kind of new to the role, uh, trying to understand kind of how the team operations work uh, and understanding where her, her spot is in the, in the whole thing. And then Keely is the girlfriend of one of the players. And so she has kind of her own arc in the show. And so we, we learn about all of them together and kind of how they interact with one the other. And that kind of talks about you know, what the show's about. So, so if, uh, I wait for the next one. So what does Ted Lasso have to do with all of this? So get, what a show about, what, let me see some chat, you know, what do people think Ted Lasso is about? Or come on, I don't know if you want people to come off mute, but just throw it in the chat, probably be easier. Adversity. That's a, you know, that's a good one. I had not, uh, well, that's, yeah, there's a show about training to move to England. Motivation is a good one. These are some new, I actually, one that I hadn't thought about, but yeah, adversity is very important. Motivation. Um, at the rise of an underdog coach. There you go. Team first. I love all of those. So to us, Ted Lasso means a few different things as well. So Ted Lasso is implementing a new system, kind of like Agile, kind of like you know, Scaled Agile or whatever you end up doing. 
staying positive. When you're doing your implementation, you're always staying positive. You really want to kind of, and Ted's always positive. He's really always looking on the bright side of things and really trying to encourage people to do better. Um, he's also about, uh, you know, terminology and a language barrier. We're really, you know, a lot of the humor from the show comes with Ted learning British English and the team kind of trying to understand Ted's, uh, you know, Americanized English. And so that's when you're doing your agile implementation, you're really, you know, you're speaking a different language, but you're trying to understand their language. Like we're trying to understand space and they're trying to understand agile and uh, kind of going back and forth on that. We're really trying to kind of meld those two together to understand and then building relationships. So Ted, the, the aforementioned people we talked about, they're all building relationships with each other. And Ted is building relationships with the team and with, uh, you know, everyone else. And so when you're coaching and understanding agile, you're really, you know, trying to engage and, and build those relationships. So we, we really push that as, as coaches and understanding that. So, and then, so one of the kind of, what Ted talks about in terms of coaching is one of the neatest things about being a coach is the connection you get to make with the players, that the loss that stays with me and hits me a lot harder than anything that happens playing a game on a patch of grass. So we kind of intersperse this with quotes. So uh, I'll do my best Ted Lasso impression. I probably should grow out the uh, mustache and throw on the uh, um, jersey or whatever. But uh, yeah, he's got a lot of good um, info like that. So we're obviously not the first people to, men to notice this. Ted Lasso um, reminded us what great leadership is like. Ted Lasso, I, I, this next article is really fascinating. And a lot of the literature about uh, agile, you'll you'll see servant leadership come up a lot. And when I when I teach classes and when I tell, especially like Scrum Master, where you're leading, I, I really tell people to watch Ted Lasso. And I'm like, this 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 show kind of talks about that idea and what he's doing and how he's approaching it. He can't. He's he's servant leadership. He's he's helping the team understand. He's coaching them. He's you know learning this new 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 system uh, that's all servant leadership and I, I you as you when you're scrum master you can't fire people you can't you have to kind of be that type of person and so we really drive that point home i really kind of think that's a good he's a good analogy for a scrum master so and, and we'll have this deck uh we we do it without the animation but there and there are tons of articles about Ted Lasso and leadership uh but i these are ones that we picked out that we really enjoyed and we really felt resonated so um and, and any of these and yeah like i said if you google Ted Lasso and leadership there's tons of articles out there uh kind of taking that idea forward so so language problems are not a joke. So Ted says, if on the show, he says, if I were fired from my job where I'm putting cleats in the trunk of my car. You get the boot for putting boots in the boot. And Ted says, I love that. So, so Jordan, you've done Scrum, right? Yes, of course. So you know all the agile terms. You mean like sprint? Uh, no, no, it's iteration. The Agile Alliance glossary says it's iteration. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about Scrum? Yeah, I've played rugby and Scrum down. No, 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 no. It's a daily stand-up. Is that the same as the daily meeting in the Agile Alliance glossary? Actually, how many terms are there in that glossary? There are 75 terms in the Agile Alliance glossary. There's over a hundred times in the safe glossary, and that is far from complete. And then there's 30 in the scrum.org glossary. So as you're, even if you're using agile, you could be using different concepts within, like we use a lot of safe, but there's people who use, you know, scrum and there's people who use, it, language problems are not a joke at all. Like we, there's a lot of opportunities to miss each other, and not understand. And so keep that in mind as you're doing your agile implementations, as you're being a coach and understanding that it's really important that you kind of drive that point home. So. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think the first, the first thing you have to recognize is that there are potential language barriers that you may not find obvious if you're helping people transition to agile. You may work just as Jordan and I do. We work in, a, in an environment where we're using these terms on a daily basis. We're talking to other people about them. We're discussing them. If there's any confusion, you know, we, we overcome that very, very easily. But if we go and meet with teams who've been working, say, in Waterfall for perhaps decades, there are some people at Lockheed who've been there literally decades, and they've only worked on Waterfall programs. So they are going to have to learn 
as you saw, perhaps a hundred new terms, maybe not all at once, but be aware that when you're speaking to people, they, the concepts in Agile are generally not very difficult. They may be difficult to master, but they're generally straightforward concepts, but there's a whole set of terminology around them that people, it will be new to people. We, we try and overcome this by both formal and informal training. So we have formal classes. We, we use the licensed scaled agile classes. We use uh, courses that we've developed in house. Um, we also run dojos where we take teams who are working together and we take some of their work and we help them improve that actual work uh, in a dojo setting. Um, we also do uh, coaching engagements. And during that, just about every interaction with the teams or the individuals, with the leaders, is an opportunity to, to help people understand a little bit more, just a little bit, one step at a time, uh, a little bit more about those, those concepts. Now, this isn't a one-way street. Um, we're bringing new technology to the teams, to, sorry, new terminology to the teams. The teams themselves are working in technology uh, in a tough space environment. Um, and they've got not just terms for everything, they've got acronyms for everything. And one of the things that has proven very useful to me is to actually read some of the documentation, get an idea of what those terms mean, how they're used, how they relate to one another. I find those relationships are most important. Like if you, if you are working with a set of doctors and nurses and you don't know fully the names of all the muscles and bones and organs and so on. But if you know enough to know that the, you know, the ankle bones connected to the shin bone or something, then you will be able to follow a conversation and alert people that you're talking about different things. If you think the, you know, the brain cells are related to your ankle, then you, know, you don't need to have that discussion now. You're going down a rabbit hole. So uh, being able to help being able to understand some of that technology is not just good from a practical point of view. It's actually fun for us in the space environment because um, neither Jordan and I had worked in space before. So that was fun. Now, one step at a time. Uh, Keely, uh, I'm sorry, Rebecca asked Ted, how was your first day, Ted? And Ted says, I'm not exactly sure what y'all small units of measurement is over here, but that's about how much headway. And that's true. Um, you do have to take small steps in, in a new job, a new position, a new role. Uh, don't try and uh, boil the ocean or you know, build Rome in a day. Uh, there are small steps you can take. One of the, the initial first steps may, might not sound like too, a very small, first step, it's maybe, maybe a medium-sized first step, but getting some type of tool in place, like whether it's version one or Jira or whatever uh, tool uh, that you're using that can track agile features and stories and, and the teams and people who are working on those things. Whatever tool it is you use will give you some immediate benefits, um, not just to measure progress, but to see progress, to see progress of the work you're doing and also progress in your agile journey. Um, it will give you uh, a view of what is going well and what is not go going not so well. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to work with a team building the roadmap. And I wanted to get a sense of these teams have been working yeah. in an agile tool for, for a while. Um, and I wanted to see, well, if they told me that this, this could be their roadmap, um, how accurately have they been performing against their estimates? Would this be a realistic roadmap? And it was really pretty easy for me to see which teams were doing very well and which teams were clearly going to need some help. So um, even just, just the basic tools will give you some great visibility into how things are going. Um, and of course, it's tracking real progress. It's not just having some, some meetings and saying to the product donor, oh, I'm, I'm nearly done. I've got another few days. And you're the only one who knows about that. Um, it's going to be available to everyone on the team and across the teams. It's going to be available. Did, did this thing get done? Did a feature finish? 
or is it still waiting to be tested? It's going to track real progress, which is what you need in an agile environment. Um, there's also a thing about, I, I brought this up because it seems like everywhere I work and maybe everywhere you all work, um, if you take a team and say, what's your capacity? And they say, it's you know, so many points. Um, and then you ask them to plan. It seems they just don't understand the rule that you shouldn't plan more than your capacity. You say, you tell them that's a rule. They say, yes, we understand that's the rule. Uh, but every time I've worked with teams, they come up with a plan that is not just a point or two over, but significantly over, significant percentage over uh, with their capacity. So what is it about rules? What is it? What is it? So Ted wants to know, how is that offside? No, really, I want to know, because he doesn't know the rules. So, and when we're planning over the capacity, we, we're and breaking course, the rules. And we have to you, understand them. If you grow up in the UK and you're watching football all the time, you understand what the offside rule is. It's really very simple. So another Absolutely. thing. So, oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Oh, no, go so, ahead. So, okay. Ted is listening for feedback all the time. So he says, I want you to know I value each of your opinions, even when you're wrong. So Ted has a lot of feedback sources at the game. He's getting at direct, immediate feedback from the fans, whether he's doing a good job or not. He's also getting feedback from the team, from the, you know, the owners, what had, you know, kind of on a, after the game, let's get some feedback on everything. Um, Ted, you know, some examples in the game, like that I think of Agile or in the, the um, show, he's, there's a scene where he does a comment box and he, no one really takes him seriously, but he says, you know, is there something we can fix? And so someone writes down, you know, the shower pressure is, is bad. He's like, that's, we can fix that we can work on. And so that's, we talk about removing roadblocks, like getting, working on stuff like that for teams. We really want the scrum masters to understand that those are the types of things you can do to help teams. And when you, when you eliminate those roadblocks, you're really helping like build that relationship and helping, you know, you're using that feedback to help at, at Lockheed. We have, you know, if you look the left is kind of our, our customers and the right is kind of our, our company and what, what we're doing, you know, in terms of, uh, the stakeholders, we, our end users of our products aren't necessarily the people who are buying them. For instance, like the government, you know, government buys a fighter jet, but they're not flying it, you know, like the pilot flies it. So we, we have to understand, you know, what do they need? What do they want? We're really building things to help, you know, that other people are, are aware of. So we have things like earned value you might've heard of. We have to keep, you know, understand how the books are running and how we're, they're paying for what they're doing. We invite our customers to PI planning events. We try to do, you know, up, do the regular demos, but then bring in, you know, customers and stakeholders to those as much as we can involve them in the process. You know, how can we, our customers might be outside of the company. How do we bring different ones in? We have subcontractors. There's a lot of things to coordinate and we really have to make sure we're getting feedback from all the sources that we're, that, you know, that are helpful to us, so. And so, so in regular feedback, Ted says, back where I'm from, you try to end a game in a tie. Well, that might as well be the first sign of the apocalypse. So in terms of like understanding, you know, uh, feedback and such, we, you know, understanding kind of at football teams report their progress, you know, at least once a week. They have wins and losses, uh, goals, goals against, uh, pat, and then the, there's the unofficial stuff, you know, pass completions, uh, assists and tackles. I'm not the biggest soccer person, Anthony's knows a lot more about that than I do, but it's, it's still something to get feedback for. Uh, so government, we're government contractor, we use Agile. We, we have to check Agile, you know, your Agile stats, velocity, uh, cap uh, capacity, all that. But then we also have to do earn value, like I talked about earlier. We have an integrated master schedule for a lot of the work we do. Here's, you know, lined up the work and we have to line that up with Agile and that takes you know, that's helped with the feedback, but we're reporting on a regular basis. So, and doing that leads to benefits. So leader, we, we wanna make sure we're having the right conversation at the right time. We're getting the visibility of the problem sooner than later. Teams are being, you know, deciding that, you know, get them down smaller, let them make better decisions. Uh, and then the visibility of problems come up sooner uh, and being smaller and self-organizing really helps, you know, make, make the process work better and, and help people make better decisions. So, 
We're always celebrating. So Ted says, if you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together. So as we're all working together, we want to make sure that, you know, everyone is involved. Everyone feels part of the team. You, everyone is very festive when we jumped on this call. We really liked hearing about that. Uh, celebrate your wins. You know, if you have, a, if you get your iteration or your sprint goal, hey, let's celebrate. You know, a great demo, great time to celebrate. Uh, customer response is also another time to, you know, we've got a really great customer response. Let's, you know, let's make a, make a point of it. And a heck, a roadblock is out of the way. You know, any reason to, you know, to get help and get happy, uh, you know, it helps everyone kind of get together and feel kind of part of the team. We're all, you know, in this together. Anybody's birthday today or this week? Or maybe a week ago or something. Any 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 birthdays? Anyone want to see with this group to wish you a happy birthday? Any any August Check birthday? Check in the chat. Whose birthday? May fifth was my birthday, Cinco de Mayo. Oh. Cinco de Mayo. That's a you know happy belated birthday. So absolutely. But uh, and celebrate, you know, and, and make a point of it. You know, we, we want special occasions to meet us. We want people to be brought into the team. We want people to understand so that they're, they're engaged. Yeah, no August birthdays, I'm surprised. Uh, but anyway, um, make the people feel welcome. Uh, we, when we do bring people into the fold, we like to do, we have a bi-weekly training we do on certain projects that's like, here's the tool, here's Agile, here's what we're trying to do. Here's the, you know, the general approach and we, that way people feel included in the part of the team. So uh, there's lots of ways to kind of keep, keep people engaged, help them feel great. There, there's a lot of celebrating in Ted Lasso. They celebrate, they end their tie streak and they lose. Uh, I shouldn't have said that, but, uh, but they celebrate anyway. And one of the guy's birthdays comes up, so they celebrate that. And there's always kind of something going on. I, the Christmas episode was a personal favorite of mine. They're all celebrating together and spending time as a group and bonding and, and, and moving together. So, and, and celebrating. And a lot of the show to me as well is about celebrating. They celebrate each other and they celebrate kind of the relationships. And so as you go through your agile journey, that's an important thing to remember and always kind of when you're moving forward. So. Okay, so celebration is part of building teams, uh, but there are other aspects that we will mention here. Um, Rebecca is a mentor for Keeley, and at one point she says, a good mentor hopes you will move on. A great mentor knows that you will. And without offering any spoilers, everyone move, moves on to some extent in, in the show. Um, just, a, just a tip for when you're, when you're leading a transition or assisting a transition, um, leaders will emerge through demonstrating their skills. Um, the, some valuable people may already be in a position of authority and they really grasp agile concepts, even if they, they haven't used them explicitly before. And they can be really powerful in having the authority and the background to have people trust them and follow them. They can also use that authority very well in giving people guidance to do things the right way, or they'll know enough to know, well, we're not going to really make everyone do this thing uh, because it's much less important than getting everybody to do something else. Like you, you might be very particular about making sure everybody includes acceptance criteria in their story. And, and less picky about exactly how they've worded the, the description of the story, because there's more value in the details of the acceptance criteria. Or again, rewarding people for making sure that they, they when they say they've completed a story, you know that they've checked the acceptance criteria, they've checked the non-functional requirements, they've checked through the definition of done, all of those things they do, um, you value that because you understand as a leader, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but this is whether someone succeeds in that new role or not really depends on the person. Are they going to learn those new concepts and learn which, which parts are more important than others? Or are they going to stick to their old habits, which we'll get to in a moment? Um, as I said, a lot of people transition in the show, and that's something that um, you you're going to see happen over over time. The people will learn more about how an agile team works and how teams of agile teams work, and they will evolve to to roles that they can succeed in. In this show, Nate starts off as the equipment manager or equipment assistant, really, and he becomes a coach and eventually even moves higher than that. 
Um, Roy Kent starts the show as a player. I think he starts as the captain. So sometime in his career he's become the captain of the team. Uh, he does spend some time as a TV pundit. That's probably one of my favorite roles that he plays because he's very outspoken in his, in his role as a TV pundit. Um, but he goes on to become a coach as well. Um, and even the, um, the actor who played him, Brett Goldstein, he was a writer on the show. And then he like, I want to try out for this role. And then he became more, and then he won an Emmy for doing that. Like they let him do that because he was, you know, he transitioned through the role. So it happens in real life too, but yeah. He really was. Yeah. He really, he really was a great example of this. Um, there's another, I'd say guidance or rule in agile, small teams are going to work better than very large teams. Um, it's another one of those roles that people find it hard to, to listen for. Um, especially if you're coming from prior structures. Again, if you're coming from a big organization, like big corporation like, like Lockheed that in the past have had some exceptionally large teams and they hear, oh, we've got to have agile teams now. So they'll put 25 people in the same team and call that an agile team. And you really have to put some effort into splitting that into, into smaller groups. Um, there's also the, this phrase I used here, use small teams with dedicated members. Um, Ted Lasso has a group called the Diamond Dogs, uh, which is essentially the tiny coaching team. They help each other coach and with some of the personal problems. Um, but um, at places like Lockheed, uh, there are some people with very, with some exceptionally specialist skills in materials or thermal properties of, um, of systems and so on. And they, there really are only a few people maybe in the country or the world who have that level of skill and expertise in that particular area. So their skills have to be shared but so they can't be dedicated team members. But it's too, it's, it can be pretty easy to fall into the trap of letting people be on two or more teams. And that kind of wrecks it, wrecks the, uh, a lot of the ceremonies and, and routines of, of an, agile, an agile team. So try to avoid that if you can, sharing people across teams. This is also going to take time. Building teams takes time. Um, just having people learn which roles are going to work well for them. Even in the head office in the show, remember Rebecca is entirely new to the role of, of owner of the team because she inherited that through a divorce. She wasn't, um, she wasn't really into, into owning a team. It's just her husband divorced her and she, she got that team. Um, but she starts to learn how to, to do that just as uh, Keely learns how to do a host of, of other things, social media and marketing and so on. So they, they tried those things. They failed at times and then they, um, they learn from that and succeed. That's that's pretty much the agile way. It's Chamba Wamba song. You get back up. And uh, Coach Beard is is a coach who's really really actually maybe it's unfair to say really has a smile, but he he uh, he generally conveys a more serious nature. But he clearly enjoys passing on his knowledge of of how to coach. He's not an expert in, in the game he's coaching, uh, but he knows how to get people to work together. He knows how to pull people out and call on them. So he's enjoying that. We definitely, I know Jordan does and I do enjoy uh, passing on our, our agile experience and knowledge and related topics uh, to the benefit of everyone we, we work with. We, we don't get that easily we don't get that without some resistance to change it's not always an easy job um, some typical examples of this is that there are agile ceremonies you you all know what what they are um, people complain there's still too many meetings and what we find out is be, it's because management especially middle management but particularly still want the familiar and comforting routines such as weekly you know, team meetings, status meetings, some meetings for planning meetings. Um, they, they, they forget that the reason that they 
had those meetings is is going to be satisfied by some of those agile um, ceremonies that, that are happening and they can give up those old comforting routines. Um, and in the game, an example of this is Jamie is the striker who's very selfish as a, as a striker. He wants to score all the goals. And he'd much rather take the shot and take a chance of scoring a goal rather than making what Ted wants, the extra pass, and uh, just about guaranteeing that the, the goal is scored by somebody else. Um, so Jamie, Jamie wants his familiar routine. Um, we're also going to change, see resistance to change in how we do things. So one thing that is quite common to see is people want to write stories that say how they're going to do their work. I'm going to do A, then B, then C, then D. And really the story is just a specification of where they want to go. What, what does the customer need? What does this piece of the system need to be able to do? However, the team gets to the team is the one is the is the group who gets to decide how you're going to do it. Uh, but the story simply needs to capture what's needed. Where are we going? And then another way that people like have been very comforting or comforted by by working is if they're a manager, they like to tell people which work they they need to do. And many employees like to be told um, what work they have been you know they, they should do next instead of what we know is a, is a much better flow of value in asking people to take something near the, the top of the priority list, take that work, pull that work when you're, when you're ready, when you've, you know you've got the skills for it, you know you've got, um, you know you've got the, the capacity to do it, the time to do it. Um, so that's, that's quite a contrast between how we would like people to do things and how they've been doing it in the past and want to continue. And in the show, an example of this is Ted. Ted simply delegates a lot of the day-to-day -day operations to Coach Beard and to Nate, when Nate, once Nate's a coach, to, to make some of the critical tactical decisions, training decisions, and so on. How to get past resistance. What did Ted say about that? So Joey? Ted says, yep, nudge that ship in the right direction, yeah. Yes, he did. Actually, I'm going to go back to that because when I read this again earlier today, when I was just reviewing the slides, I thought there's a good football analogy here. Suppose you're the defender and the player with the ball is running towards you and your goal is to get the ball. You, you want the ball for your team. You want to stop that guy. Now, one way to do it is to stand right in front of them, try and tackle them right there. But if they're quicker and faster, um, they might pass the ball through your legs and just run right by you. You get one chance, one shot, it's not going to work. Now, good defenders will just run along with the player with the ball and actually just nudge them at the right spot just as it puts them off balance and the ball becomes free and the defender collects it. That's a much better way. Just that nudge, that ship in the right direction reminded me of that. Um, and just, just you know, to emphasize that nudging idea, we try and not tell people what to do. We try and nudge them in the right direction. Let them try and discover many of the better ways to do things. They're working on work they, they understand. They just haven't organized themselves typically in a way that makes them do it in the most effective way. Um, so we like, like to nudge them rather than telling them. And there is a, there is a lead tasso. Now lead tasso is not a typo here. There really is an alter ego of Ted Lasso. Um, and lead tasso, Ted's alter ego, starts telling, telling the team to run laps and pass the ball this way and that way and do things exactly as he says. He, uh, he for comedic effect, he turns into lead tasso. So don't be lead tasso. Try and be more like Ted. Um, we want teams to have ways to explore alternate processes, um, along with the safety of understanding that they, they might fail. But we want to give them the opportunity in it to innovate, to give them the freedom to understand they have that creativity option to them of getting the work done in a safer, faster, higher quality way. They know best how that might happen. And in the past, they may have been 
told how to do things and we want to give them that safe space and we'll trust people to do the right thing um there's very few people who get to work at Lockheed who who won't do the right thing if they're provided with a, a safe, positive environment. Um, but also we want to teach them those skills for retrospectives, inspect and adapt, so all those things that give them feedback for how they might do things, how they might do things better and learn from whether they're successes or failures. And along those lines, um, Keeley says at one point, you know the saying, you buy a man a table, he eats once. You teach a man how to get a table and he eats at that restaurant until it becomes a Starbucks. So, so on to planning. Oh, what sorry. does Ted say? Ted says, I'm not planning on that. No, my plan is for my plan to work, but you know what they said about best laid plans, right? So I've, I've already spoken about this. The team strongly resist planning to capacity. Every team I've encountered is too optimistic. I'll say even to the point of that famous phrase, irrational exuberance. Um, so we got to give them tough feedback. We have to give them honest feedback. We, uh, they might not like it. They might not like being told. This is not a nudge. This is actually a command. We're going to get support from leadership to do that. But we're not the only ones who need to give honest feedback. <clears throat> we need to encourage the teams to give each other honest feedback, whether they, you know, they they brush through something and let a bug slip through, um, whether they weren't as as open about a problem that they had that they could have asked for help for, whatever it is. We want to give them encouragement to uh, speak up and give that feedback because feedback is how good systems work um, make they work well with high quality high speed and so on and in in the agile world there are some specific roles that where we think that there is explicit responsibility to exemplify and and cultivate an agile mindset and that obviously product owners, scrum masters, coaches, and if you scale that up with scaled agile and you end up with at least train engineers, solution train engineers and, and PMs, that's prime ministers? No, not prime ministers, product managers. <laughs> um, but overall, uh, remember that your teams are like professional athletes. They, they want to win. They really do want to do a good job. And we're just here to, to facilitate them getting better outcomes for the effort that they they put in and just as a little background to the place the the context in which jordan and i work uh we're in the space software factory that's related to the overall lockheed um, software factory now software factory is a concept of combining people processes and tools and as it says here to to move ideas and requirements to secure high quality products at the speed of relevance. So that's kind of a marketing spiel. Uh, but we do work as part of a, a, a team that's not just advocating agile. We're putting um, DevOps and DevSecOps in place and across many parts of Lockheed. Uh, we're working with tool chains, automating tests, um, making people understand the, the better ways to do con um, configuration management builds and, and so on. Those approaches that technically are important to being successful in not just the software world, but we're exploring avenues for, for making sure we um, pass on best practices for working uh, with hardware and systems in an agile way and a tool supported way, an integrated tool support way. Um, but overall, when we when we engage with with groups, we have to remember that people are the most valuable resources that we have. Maybe at least until AI comes along. But at the moment, people are the most valuable resource we have. We treat people with respect. We want them to have a purposeful job. You know, you know, research has pretty clearly shown that people with um, mastery, autonomy, and purpose in their job are happier and they produce better results. Um, a big part of that is people feeling safe 
in exploring opportunities for success and sometimes failure and, and a learning environment. So we want to support them in that. And that we do understand, we have to remember that to understand that change is difficult for everyone. So we go in, we can see how things should be working, but we've got to encourage people to, to change. So in summary, there'll be language barriers. We're saying take small steps, listen to feedback, put your ego to the side just as Ted, Ted does and don't get defensive, create a safe space and be honest. Regular and consistent reporting so we get the real state of the world. Don't forget to celebrate take every opportunity to do that, but also expect resistance to change. So they're the main things we've said. And there's a nice comment there, be humble and be kind from Michael. So we believe. What do we believe? Ted, we believe in the principles of Agile. And, and we would like to thank you all oh, for coming to our TED Talk. I love it. And thank you. <laughs> I love that. That was amazing. That was amazing, guys. Oh, my God. Woo! Thank you. It's, thanks. It's fun to do. I know thank we you. didn't directly engage with, with the chat as we were doing that. So is it, do we want to go back and try and answer any questions that came up? Absolutely. If you have I do see. Use yeah, we, uh, uh, I saw. Oh, the, the flags thing. Yeah, that's how we kept our track of each other. So when we, <laughs> that's why I knew like, oh, this is Anthony's slide, this is my slide. And yeah, it, it kind of keeps us, uh, and with the whole UK, US theme, we kind of kind of work with that. So yeah. what else though? Yeah. Let's check out the chat. All right, so it's a comment. It has been a wonderful, it has been wonderful. Thanks so much. This was a lovely presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Michael. Who put the Phoenix project in? We're speaking at the DevOps Summit in next month. The Gene Kim Phoenix project, is that, saw that that's in there? That's, yeah, that was what I was referring to based on Michael's uh, comment. We're doing the same presentation at the, at the, at the DevOps Summit. So Gene Kim Where's must that? like these ideas too. Where's uh, that Vegas? going to be? In Vegas. Hey, yeah. So nice. we're pretty pumped about it. Just got the call. So. Oh, that's great. When is it? Is it the fourth First of week October? of October. Okay. Yeah, right. somewhere in there. So yeah. Oh, lots of, I'm I'm may, waiting my way through the chat. There's a lot in here. Yeah. Is that gonna be virtual? The DevOps. I know we're going in person. Uh, I don't know if there's a virtual option or not, um, but I, I will be on the on the stage. So, I have a question for you guys. You guys saw the the last season, right? No, I am <laughs> caught up. Anthony is not. So. Okay, so Jordan, you saw the last season, right? You saw the last season. Yes. And I'm terrible with names. I'm terrible with names. But uh, there were so many lessons learned, there were, you know, and I love the way that you guys are comparing it to coaching, you know, and, and agile teams. I think that's that's awesome that you guys did that. Um, but there was just going back to all the lessons learned and I'm terrible with names, but the the coach that went to the opposite team, what was his name? Do you remember? That was Nate. He went Nate. Yeah. That was, the, that was the shorter Nate. guy. Yeah. Yeah, his name, right? And then, and then the second coach that works with Ted, what's his name? The guy with the beard, the one that everybody's saying it, the picture looks like Marcelo. <laughs> his name. That um, is Coach Beard. Yeah. Coach Beard. Coach okay. Beard is so, his name. I don't know if that's his real name. Is that his real yeah. name in the show? I don't know. No, he's got another name. So at the end, yeah, that, that was his real name. Yeah. Sure, sure. So the the lesson at the end when when they asked Nate to come well I don't want I don't want to give it away but you know the lesson at the end with Nate right and then how how Ted handled that and everybody was like oh my god like the team was so mad at Nate and you know and what Nate did but the way that that Ted handled that and then there was a lesson with Coach Beard of something that had happened in Coach Beard's past and Ted reminded him of that and then he's the one that went and, and went to get Nate to bring him back. But there was a lesson there. 
And I'm trying to remember if there was a quote or there was something that Ted told Coach Beard and then it made him think um, about, you know, it's about second chances and giving people second chances. And I thought that was very, that was a great lesson. But he said something and I'm trying to remember what he said. I can't remember what he said, but it was like, wow. I know the moment. Yeah. And I can't think of the quote, but I know exactly what you're saying. And when, when we coach, you know, it's like you talk about second chances a lot. I mean, we work yeah. with people kind of repetitively and it's, you know, people, you aren't going to get it the first time and we're, you know, we got to keep at it. And there's, you know, no one's, I struggled at the beginning of Agile too. And I, you know, everyone, it takes their own speed. And yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, forgiveness in agile and I, you know it, it sounds kind of hokey but it's it's very true to kind of like you know and it's, be, it's about be having person empathy and maybe... having empathy right absolutely and putting where are they coming from shoes, right so i i that was we, one we, of my favorite moments in the last season and it was such a great lesson it was all about empathy and putting yourself in other people's shoes which is really good Ted really like you know, like serving sort of leadership stuff like he gets to know everybody like he's even friends with jamie and even when jamie in the beginning jamie goes to another team and he's still like yeah you know it is it, it, it empathizes with him and they they as their relationships and everyone's you know um like you learn more about jamie's past and you learn about, about like roy kent's life and the mm -hmm. you know the people and how they came to be but ted and when you coach and when you're doing agile like understanding like we have to understand like Anthony said, like we have people been doing waterfall for decades and we have a large, some people are executing agile really well at the company. Some people haven't even heard of it yet. So we really have a lot of like our work cut out for us, like understanding where these people are coming from. And anyone who's doing agile or implementing it really has to kind of, I, I think agile to me is more of soft skills. The basics of agile aren't terribly complicated, but you really have to understand you're who you're going to and how you're approaching it and that that's half the battle more probably uh, two-thirds of the battle right there the rest oh. of it you know is fairly straightforward so i think ruben ruben which one's the quote you put the you found the quote yeah i think the one that says is, i hope that either all of us or none of us are judged by the actions of our weakest moments but rather by the strength we show when and if we're given a second chance i guess that's it there that's it. There you go. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's it. I think I, I, I can't it. find it now in, in the chat, but I think somebody mentioned about how important it all of this is as a people problem. I wouldn't say a people problem, but a, as getting people to, to work together. Um, it, it, I'll, although we work in a very high tech industry, there's still most of the issues for getting solutions to things is about getting people to work together and not so much about getting the technology to work. People are normally smart enough to do that if they, they work in a positive way. Yeah. And creating that. that, that and people ask me, oh, what were you saying, Regina? Sorry about that. You know, creating that safe environment, you know. Yeah. A lot of people ask me about like agile theory and like, what do you think of this? And I, I think it's more important to just like work with people and understand what they're trying to do than try to like impose theory when you talk about like agile and stuff and let's see what you're trying to do. And let's, let's, let's put agile around what you're doing versus forcing you to take on something new and try a completely new, it's a new process, but like I have someone in the beginning was saying they've been doing this forever. They just didn't ever call it agile. And a lot of people are doing that already. It's just like, let's, let's take what you're doing and, you know, put that on it. You know, Ted lets the players be themselves. He really lets them kind of, you know, uh, he puts them in a, in a situation to win. He's not a, a soccer expert, but he really like, like lets them be themselves and, and, and empathizes, like we said before, and that's where the strength lies. And that's, you know, to me in an agile implementation. So, yeah, anyway, I'm just, I'm just blabbling now. Sorry. <laughs> I, I want to contrast that, though. I, I fully believe it is mainly about the people, but I really enjoyed um, Donald Reinertsen's book about the principles of product development flow and how he explains some of them, the, the mathematics behind why good flow you know, works. Um, and we've got to incorporate those ideas as well. It's not just about people being happy with each other and with their team. Uh, so many of the the agile practices work because they're the supportive of those those kind of mathematics that you see in the in that book as well. 
and I know they've been borrowed by by Safe and incorporated there as well. But um, I think Donald Ryanson deserves a lot of credit for explaining what, how the the ideas do work in practice. 